Welcome, welcome, welcome to all of you to this place of learning. Welcome everyone. It's a song, a greeting welcome song from the Māori people of Aotearoa, New Zealand, which is where I'm from. I'm the convener of the session and I'm very honoured to be here. One of my favourite themes, my favourite hands in the soil and my favourite heart space, plants. And my name is Rabina McCurdy. We're going to be having a total of 30 minutes, 20 minutes of presentations and 10 minutes of question and answer dialogue. Um, but in Chris's case, she's going to be giving a 10 minute presentation and obviously people involvement is important for Chris because she's allowing 20 minutes for interaction, question, answer, and we may even rearrange the seats. It'll be up to Chris <laughs> how we do that at the end. So this is Chris Marsh, and she's doing Plants for a Permaculture Future. And it's my sense with Chris that she is at the front line of this work because she's blending the research work and she's bringing together the work of the Permaculture Association and this and Plants for a Future. Um, and she's really looking at how can this serve um, gardeners and plants people worldwide. So be in for a plant extravaganza with Chris. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, if you'll forgive me, I'm going to read uh, my presentation uh, because I've timed it carefully to take only 10 minutes. The important thing will be the discussion that follows. Thank you. Chris, I'm going to give you a volume check as well. So if I'm finding I'm not hearing you up here, I'm just going to go like that. That's my understanding. Thank you. Thank you. That's you, you fine. Okay, yeah. I'm still working on it. Uh, so yes, seems to be. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> Oh, it's lovely to be looked after. <laughs> um, my name's Chris Marsh, and I have been a trustee of plant the charity Plants for a Future for 10 years. The charity was founded in 1996 to support the work of Ken Fern, plants researcher. Currently, Plants for a Future supports an online database of 7,000 useful plants, freely available and accessed by over a million users each year worldwide. Plants for a Future has had links with permaculture from the start, and we've had a collaboration arrangement with Chris Warburton Brown, research coordinator at the Permaculture Association, for three years. But Plants for a Future is not a permaculture project, and most of the users of our database are just interested in plants. But the Plants for a Future database has huge potential as a resource for the design of diverse polycultures such as woodland gardens. The question is, how can permaculture designers make, make better use of this valuable resource? The firm's 28-acre site in Cornwall is still called The Field because in 1989, when they bought it, it was degraded agricultural land on an exposed sloping site. Now it is a beautiful and productive oasis, half natural woodland, half diverse food forest. Over 10 years, Ken planted 1,500 species of plants with edible and other uses. From the start, the site was vegan organic, growing plants without depending in any way on domesticated livestock. Plant-based compost was used, no manure other than human, no grazing. Barriers against rabbits and deer were installed where necessary. Vegan organics is an ethical imperative for the ferns. It'll be a practical necessity in the future, an issue I'll come to later. Next we come to phase two, plants for the future as it is now. Plants for the future became online and international in 1996 when Ken Fern and colleagues set up a website and database with details of the 1500 species he had planted. Ken also carried out desk research and added details of other useful species. When the new trustees of the charity took over in 2005, there were 7,000 useful plants. Since then, we have redesigned the website and further developed the database. Images have been added, 
The detailed information has been checked and hundreds of new species have been researched and are, are about to be added to the database. This is an example of the high quality plants information provided by the database. This entry includes all you need to know about this variety of Eliagnus and there are 22 other varieties. This is just data, bits and bytes, but it's used by a lot of people. Web analytics show there are two and a half million visits by five mil uh, to five million pages annually. We hear from some of these users via social media and most of them are not permaculture designers, just plants enthusiasts and researchers. Highly flexible search facilities have been provided for plants experts and for designers of polycultures and forest gardens. The search facilities allow you to select from over 7,000 edible and medicinal plants using criteria including common and Latin names, keyword, family, habitat and use. The main uses are edible and medicinal, plus other practical uses and characteristics. The facility search properties allows you to search for a number of plant features at once. For example, for a plant that needs a light sandy soil, is between a metre and five metres high, and like shade. The database will then present a list of plants that have all three of these features. We also publish books. The words we put on the back of cover of our latest book, Edible Perennials, suggest how permaculture designers might use the database. I'll read it out. Current interest in forest or woodland garden designs reflects an awareness that permanent mixed plantings are inherently more sustainable than annual monocultures. They safeguard and enrich soil ecosystems, enable plants to form cooperative combinations, make use of layers above and below the soil, and they create benign microclimates which soften winds and recycle rain. The challenge is productivity. How can yields of useful foods and other useful materials be maximised? Plants for a Future is a resource for discovering some of the answers. My vision for Plants for a Permaculture Future is of millions of local agricultural ecosystems designed to meet local needs using local resources. Each local design would include one or more areas of land with diverse permanent plantings and the Plants for a Future database would be an invaluable resource for looking up details of such plantings, allowing designers to select plants for particular uses suited to situations within an ecological design based on natural models, especially woodland or forest gardens. Millions sounds ambitious. It means replicating Ken Fern's transformation of a patch of degraded land into a food forest all over the world. Ken and others have shown that this is not impossible and it could be what the world urgently needs. Jared Diamond has said that agriculture was the worst mistake in the history of the human race. Over the course of history, ancient civilizations collapsed when they destroyed or overexploited the forests and soils they depended on. Small scale subsistence agriculture is not much better. Land holdings are tiny, insecure, <coughs> and they get consolidated into industrial monocultures and the villagers flee to the city. This is the root of days, today's ecological and social crisis. So what's the alternative? We need to look back to the pioneers, Mollison and Holmgren's permaculture and to Gore and Elmhurst's rural reconstruction initiatives. The Bengali poet and polymath Rabindranath Tagore, my particular area of study, made his life's work a programme of rural revival in India. Each local community would be self-sufficient and culturally rich, life in its completeness, as Tagore described it. Tagore was assisted in this work by the agriculturalist and entrepreneur Leonard Elmhurst, who went on to establish the Dartington Hall Trust in Devon, 
which indirectly gave rise to transition town Totnes. Tagore and Elmhurst achieved great things for half a century each, but both initiatives were overcome by the tides of urbanization and globalization. Their message was back to the village and the forest, and now may be the time to listen to that message again. Combining Ken Fern's researches with permaculture and rural reconstruction could show us how to regenerate the forest destroyed by agriculture. But could such forests meet the, current and the, the needs of current and future world populations? The Fern's original design for their 30-acre plot was her half natural woodland, half vegan organic food forest. A social and ecological revolution is needed if the fern's design were replicated worldwide, would that work? The transition approach is crucial. Start with a vision of, say, 30 years into the future and make a plan of how to get there. It's actually quite encouraging to quantify the goal. The Earth has 12 billion acres of agricultural land, arable and pasture. That's about 40% of the total land area. They may be as many as 10 billion people by 2050, which still means over an acre per person. In theory, a vegan diet could support five people per acre. On the size of each community, it's useful to take Dunbar's number of 150, based on his research showing that humans can only comfortably maintain 150 stable relationships. Seven groups of people that size cooperating together locally would make a typical neighbourhood of around 1,000 people. That works out as 10 million neighbourhoods, each with one or more areas of diverse perennial plantings in its 1,000 to 1,200 acres. There are many obvious challenges. Getting access to land, the extent of land degradation worldwide, urbanisation, and restrictions on using land for subsistence agriculture rather than <coughs> cash crops. As I said in my introduction, I've been looking after the charity Plants for Future for 10 years, seeing that as a phase two of its history. I'd like to think it could be more than an information source for plants enthusiasts. The search facilities are a valuable resource for forest garden designers. I have my own vision of the future, inspired by my studies of Rabindranath Tagore, whose ideas were ahead of his time. I've always seen his efforts to revive village India as a form of early permaculture. Relocalization back to the village and the forest sounds utopian, but it is the only sure way to sustainability. These are some of the questions which occur to me, but I'd appreciate your own comments and questions. Thank you. Your first, thank you. Um, my name Where is Francis? I'm Polish, German, and Australian, so I'm going to be living in Australia. That's enough, thank you. Thank and you the question. What's, this, what's the website of the database? I missed that part. Sorry? The website address. I'm, I'm going to pick on here. PFAF.org. Thank you. Again, please. <laughs> it was an easy one, wasn't it? PFAF.org. <laughs> yes. Hi. Uh, Mark Schiefman from the Netherlands. Um, we. There's a, uh, a, a difficulty with the names of the plants. Um, so I've been busy translating the database. Right. It's a lot of work. Yes. Uh, are there any centralized initiatives to translate the database to other languages so they can be accessed more easily for native speakers of certain countries? Mm. Um, well, we, we publish a number of books, um, and we've made a start on that with French. Well, for the first book that we published, which is called Edible Plants, is also available in French. We've got some people looking at German um, possibilities, um, but we, we hope that the Latin name is, is a help, and of course English is a, has become very much an international language. Um, but please do get in touch because it's something we're very, very aware of and something that we, it's certainly something that um, to, to grow the database we certainly need to address, yes. Yes. Just a comment, really. My name, please. Sorry. Oh, sorry, John Porter from, from the UK. Yep. <laughs> um, it's wonderful to this connection between Tagore and Ken Fern. Just, just a comment. I mean, I'm a fan of Tagore 
I know, and he's working in various places. Are there any examples in India of anything connected with Tagore with the forest gardens set up in India? That's a good question. I actually don't know. I shall visit the group downstairs so yes. they know. That. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yes. And so good because I've used Ken Fern's book for a long time and it's so good to see the cont continuity now. Yes. Um, Tagore himself, of course, died in 1941, so yeah. it's a whole sort of lifetime away. Um, before he died, he instituted um, a special day of the year um, for planting trees. Um, I mean, trees were planted all the time there. It was a desert. Shantinaketan is where he established, first of all, a school in 1901 and then a university in 1921. And he began the rural reconstruction initiatives in um, the 1920s with the help of Leonard Elmhurst. And um, the, the, the aim of it was diversity, <coughs> both in terms of the <coughs> varieties of, of plants and, and, you know, he, they were not against domesticated livestock in that particular mm -hmm. situation, and Elmhurst um, instituted um, more <coughs> variety of both plants and animals. Um, Tagore's main interest was that life should be culturally rich. He encouraged people to participate in singing, dancing, dramas, um, this was fundamental to his thinking. He was not against um, modern machinery or methods. Um, so that's one of the reasons I feel he's, um, he was like permaculture. You know, it was very flexible. The important thing was that um, everybody should um, experience joy in their lives. Um, so he was a, an important example. Yeah. No, uh, that's true, but the, the, a lot of the commercial ventures, I mean, Elmhurst's aim was to address um, the decline of rural employment because of uh, mechanisation being brought into agriculture in the 1920s. There was a dip um, in the agricultural jobs available, and so what he tried to do was to set up um, industries to, pr to provide employment for, to keep um, people um, active uh, in employment locally. Um, so his form of rural reconstruction was, um, was actually quite advanced and industrial. Some of the things that he did we um, probably would not prove of. He planted um, a lot of conifer plantations, for example, which are currently being um, uh, utilised and then replanted with um, you know, more variety of plants of um, trees. Um, he also brought in um, industrial chicken, chicken units, which is something that I personally find appalling. But the aim, the central aim, which was to keep the employment local and rural, um, was absolutely fundamental. And um, I agree about um, Schumacher College. I always thought it should have been called Tagore College, though. <laughs> Thank you. We have time for one more question um, from our... Hi, I'm Thais from Miami. And uh, my question is if you have in the database, does it include subtropical and tropical species as well? Oh, that's an extremely important question. Um, it does include some. And we've at the moment got some an, another thousand almost plants that are about to be put online. And one of the main focuses of that is to have more plants which are tropical. There are quite a lot of plants which um, actually can thrive in different climate zones. Um, but we're very aware of the fact that we need to extend that. Um, I, uh, I, I hoped there would be more time for, for more questions, but please come up to me and, and, and ask and do participate because um, the, the website um, is linked to social media. We have Twitter, we have Facebook, we have a blog. Um, what we really badly we need to know is what people are doing with this plant information out there. It's one of my ambitions to try and find out what um, um, the majority, in fact, of our users um, are from North America rather than from the UK. So this thing has spread all, of, all the way around the world. Um, but the, we would really like to, um, to know how many permaculture people are actually using the information on this database. 
um, whether they are extending the set of plants that they, they are using in um, woodland and forest plantings and perennial plantings and it's, um, ha actually have some information about designs which we can add to the, to the website. Um, so uh, it, this is very much for me a turning point. This, this has been phase two with all these bits and bytes, about 7,000, soon to be 8,000 plants on the database. We need to move into a phase three where people are using this information creatively <coughs> and we, we share um, the, the designs that we've come up with and the uses that we've made of this information. Guess what? We are time rich. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a sweep hand watch, not a digital. I was looking at the the, the wrong <laughs> hand, the, the, the little rather than the big. So we've actually got ten more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> we've got ten thousand more breaths. So, um, <laughs> Hi, my name is Candela. I'm from Spain, mm. and um, I'm a user of the of the whole page of the yeah. So I I I have a I think. A, Sometimes I'm in doubt of how much of trust on edibility there is, like uh, with the plants. How how because uh, some things maybe do not taste that good. I try and so on, and uh, I want to know how how much um, uh, is it. Oh, sorry, I'm having a hard time formulating myself. Um, Take your time. Yes. Mm, so okay. Please do your time, Rich. <laughs> how how much how much a study is it behind the edibility of the plants? The edibility. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Uh, that's an extremely good question. Um, a couple of months ago, two of the trustees of Plants for Future, myself and Wendy State, um, actually went round um, the field, as they still call it, um, uh, with Ken Fern and his wife, Addy. And all of the way they were saying, you can eat this, you can eat that, and this, this is best this time of year. This is for this sort of nutritional... Um, need and so on and so forth and it was fascinating you know they they walk around their site and they they see the edibility um, but I do think that there are there need to be more studies into um, how we can meet the people's dietary needs from these sort of mixes of plants the other thing that's that's sorely needed is um, better more accessible information about where you can actually get the plants the information itself has been checked and double-checked. Since we have the, the website redesigned, um, the, um, <coughs> we've had an expert, both in the technology and in plants, um, check the information. And we, we you know, as far as we can tell, it's sound and good. But the question of edibility, the edibility is, is ranked from, you know, just... Um, uh, it's apples, you get one to five apples. And in the plant search, you can actually search on a range of edibilities, edibility. So you can say three to five apples and, and you can look also at the medicinal uses and other uses. Um, the the um, search facilities are very sophisticated and there are actually videos of how to use that facility because it's quite challenging how to get some good information out of it. Um, but all the time we're wanting to enrich the information, um, get better information, because it's a very different way of producing food for people. And one of my motivations is the awareness that our species has been destroying forests all the time there's been this species. When we were hunters and gatherers, we burnt the forests down in order to encourage um, new growth to encourage prey species. Um, we have destroyed forests for agriculture. Um, our main impact on the planet has been destroying forests. It is our duty to find a way to coexist with forests. And we can actually meet our need from forests. How, how brilliant is that? Um, and you know, that it, it, it will be possible, but as you say, it, it requires work, it requires more information, it requires information that's bits and pieces to be put together into solid designs and, and solid experience you know, that people have found. It needs better information about how to source the plants, how they, <coughs> how they do in different situations. This was one of Ken Fern's main aims, was to get people to try out the plants he found successful or less successful in different parts of the country, different parts of the world. Yeah. Um, I'm Rabina Magurdi from Aotearoa, New Zealand. So across the permaculture globe, um, my experience is 
there's niches for edible landscape plants that actually aren't occupied that could be in a way that those plants aren't invasive to that culture. Mm -hmm. For example, in the United States, my colleague goes to South America and the understory plants in the maybe the more shady areas um, for Washington State that are suitable, that don't exist, bringing them back. In Portugal, I've just been with a colleague and he's saying, this is just like coastal New Zealand, but where are they? Da, 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 mm. Sourcing. And across the world with permaculture yeah. people, it's like that. Mm. So I think mm. we may know globally yes. the yes. cross fertilization yeah. of sources yeah. and also um, maybe the legislation, how to get those plants into that country is important. Mm. How do people feed that kind of information into this? Because uh, it helps us practically. Right. Um, there again, crucial question. As I said, we are on the social media, we get a lot of um, um, flow of conversation and discussion in that way. Um, but the, 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 the crucial thing is the collaboration with um, the Permaculture Association. Chris Warburton Brown has been a colleague of ours um, for, for three years. We need to build on that. Because, I mean, what we need to do is just to see some examples of um, trials of the combinations of plants that we're suggesting as alternatives to the standard 30 or so species, which is the ones that we um, all depend on. Um, we need some solid research. We need people to come forward and say, I've tried this and it wasn't so successful. I've tried that and it was better sharing that information and we feel that the collaboration between Plants for a Future and the Permaculture Association and their research is the way forward. Um, and any ideas that you, you guys have about how to share, how to, to get to know what people are doing, um, what they've tried, what they want to try, what they've tried to get hold of and couldn't, um, and so on and so forth. I mean, the, the, the scope of this is huge. Um, but there are people out there that are already doing this work, so we just we need to share this information. Yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Hugh from the UK. Uh, we're, we're talking a lot about the future and where we can go and how we need to expand and share resources, but I think part of it should be about consolidating on what we have. Mm -hmm. And in the field, we have sort of a living resource mm -hmm. of plants. Mm -hmm. So, what is the longevity of the field and how's that going to be? Right. Well, that again, that's a good, <laughs> good question. It's the last question, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, anybody would, that's interested is welcome to come and ask me the story of Plants for Hucha, what, what happened to that um, from 1989 onwards, because it's, um, it's a very fascinating story. Um, but there was a point in time when um, it grew into uh, a vibrant community and lots was happening and there was even uh, plans to set up an eco-village on another site. Um, but um, that fell apart and it fell apart for sort of people reasons really more than anything else. And um, after that there, there were fewer people to maintain the field, to, to look after it and it does require maintenance. I mean. It, when th these are natural models, but they are artificial food forests. They are, you can't just leave them and hope that they will continue to produce food. Um, they need maintenance. And one of the things that the new trustees did when we took over 10 years ago was to commission an ecological survey of the field, and that included looking at the indigenous plants because Ken's idea was it would be half natural woodland, half food forest. And an ecological survey was done by experts um, looking at the mix of plants and um, have making some sort of judgment about um, its sustainability uh, as a food producing site. And we produced um, a report of that, a detailed report which you can get off the website. Um, but you know, this, this is one of the challenges. These, these are food forests, but it doesn't mean that you can just go back to being a hunter-gatherer because um, hunter-gatherers need enormous, um, uh, uh, I, c I can't remember the figure, I have known, how many um, acres of um, woodland you would need to support just hunter-gatherers. And you need much more concentrated um, production of food. And th this is the challenge, is how 
to produce enough food um, in, in such an ecosystem, in an artificial ecosystem, and how to maintain it and sustain it. Um, it one of the biggest um, uh, labours involved is harvesting. It takes a lot of effort to harvest berries and leaves and in season and so on. Um, so, I mean, these brilliant questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, yeah. Dedication to the food process we switch technology operators. <laughs> Standing like a tree with my roots dug down, my branches wide and open. Down come the rain, out come the sun. Born is the fruit of the heart that is open to be. Standing like a tree. Standing like a tree with my roots stuck down, my branches wide and open, join the Down come the rain, out come the sun. Born is the fruit of the heart that is open to be standing like a real life forest. <laughs> We're waking up. Um, okay, so uh, as Looks this... Looks like we're going to have an intro by the third man as himself. Right? As this thing is... Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, well, yeah. Yeah, go for you it. Go. Um, so, just to say, while this thing is waking up, uh, my name is Thomas Renyatz. Um, I have been researching forest gardens... Oh, For three bottom. years okay. full on. Yeah, that's um, right. Globally. And yeah. his uh, presentation was Real Polycultures... Uh -huh. How plants and people interact in the forest garden. Imagine, we humans are part of the ecosystem. Would you believe that? Um, for some reason. Not just eaters, but spreaders. Not just spreaders of seeds, but interactors and observers and subtle managers of the ecosystem. So, while well, we've got this technology happening, instead of focusing on here, we're focusing on our collective wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> and our experience. Oh, and um, any techies? Do you need a tech assistant? Yes, I do. Um, yeah. Okay. Behind the curtains. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I'll, I'll just start with my presentation. Yeah, sure. I think while uh, that's being sorted. So um, yeah. So I've been uh, researching forest gardens for three years, uh, and uh, really with the emphasis on the practice of forest gardens. So looking at what people are doing, like how people are using this concept of multi-story plantings and adapting it to their needs, uh, to their own situations. Um, and with the point of that being to use that review of practice to then look at the theory of forest gardening and kind of how, yeah, how, how we develop that. Great, excellent. Here we are. Um, okay, so, uh, and what I've been looking uh, at really is, uh, you could say like the first generation forest garden. So it's a very young concept in temperate climates. It's 30 years old, so we're talking about young adults really just coming into their prime really. So uh, it's kind of time to uh, do a review of that, I thought. So um, just a quick overview over the theory of forest gardens, how it started off, and some of the key names and their contributions. We might add to that Patrick Whitefield, who in the 1990s added some of uh, some horticultural depth to Robert Hart's initial vision. Um, and yeah, so it's, uh, the theory is coming on quite nicely. Uh, when I started looking at it, I was surprised that there wasn't really a systematic review of what people have actually done for the real life situation in the field. And so that's, I set myself that as a task. And uh, so we, we did a, a baseline survey of uh, like to which people from 130 sites from North America and Europe mostly <coughs> contributed. Uh, and out of that I selected 40 sites uh, to do in-depth case studies, so like do desk research and site uh, interviews and where I could also site visits. And really that my interest was to find out the patterns of what makes forest gardens successful, what are the common challenges that people are facing. Um, and um, so if we're looking at uh, what I found out, so there's a, oh, wrong button. Uh, so the early indications are there's like, there's, oh, 
got a bit of a time delay on it. Um, so early indications, so there's a great diversity of forest gardens out there for, in terms of scale. They range from like five square meters to 30 hectares, you know, so as like actually kind of are they the same thing? Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of functions, what people are using them for, for private use, for community use, for commercial uh, plantings. Uh, but, and uh, resulting from that also a vast diversity of layouts. Um, so overall, we can say that forest gardens have great potential in terms of yield. Uh, and that's not just physical yield, that can be social, that can be ecological, uh, that can be economic as well. Um, but to, in order to realize that yield, it's really important uh, to develop the skill set. So it's a knowledge intensive way of production. It's not necessarily energy intensive. <coughs> Uh, it labor intensity, uh, we can talk a bit more about that, but it's definitely knowledge intensive. So there are certain key skill sets that we have to develop if we want to do forest garden in a good and productive and successful way. Um, uh, let's have a look at them in a bit more detail. Uh -huh. So a great example of forest gardens uh, productive potential is uh, Graham Bell and Nancy Woodhead's uh, site. It's a home garden in the Scottish borders. Um, so not only is, this, is it extremely productive um, in, in volume or mass, biomass, uh, edible biomass that's produced, uh, it's that biomass, uh, that edible biomass occurs over the whole year. So it's like in terms of yield over time, it's very, very good. As literally every uh, every day of the year, you can go and pick something with peaks in spring and autumn, um, and it's a, a remarkable density and diversity of yields as well uh, coming on in there. So, if we're looking at kind of why is that garden so successful, there's like, I think there's two key uh, reasons there, and one is uh, first success, success factor is that both Nancy and Graham have like three key skills like, uh, that I'd say are the core skills of a good forest gardener. So that's ecology, knowing how nature works in your place where you live. There's horticulture, so actually being able to work with plants. Uh, and, um, and, and finally, design. So think about how we lay them out, how, we, how they develop over time, and how we adapt with that. So that's uh, those three core skills. Nancy and Graham both have them. They also uh, have a long-term relationship with the land, and that's the second success factor. Now, they've been there for 25 years, and they have evolved with that system. Um, so, um, so those three skills and the longevity of their relationships with it really make that garden so successful. Um, if you're looking at the social potential of forest gardens, um, uh, it's quite important to think about that, because most uh, sites are managed by more than one person, often by groups of people, um, especially if you're looking at community situations and uh, in public spaces. I mean, more and more uh, forest gardens are emerging in those sort of situations. And um, there we really have, like, they function as an edge space, you know, so there are people from all uh, different sections of the community, people from different walks of life with different backgrounds meeting in that space, so designing the space uh, to make that interaction uh, happen and make it fruitful is, a, uh, is an interesting challenge. And um, so it offers a variety of yields, you know, so and again and again, when you ask people in those sort of situations why they're, what they're in, for, in it for, uh, like food is uh, one aspect, but learning, uh, nature connection and connection with other people very often are as important, if not more important to people like working in forest gardens. It's really great places to learn about how nature works and how we work with nature. You know, so that's really key. Um, so in order to make those spaces work, um, the fourth skill set comes in, and uh, broadly I term that people skills. So how do we work together? Um, so if we're thinking about kind of the core skills, ecology, horticulture, design, in those sort of situations, they're rarely evenly distributed. You know, there'll be experts and specialists, um, some people who know a lot and some people who know very little to start with. So the process of exchanging knowledge and of passing on knowledge 
becomes really, really important in those sort of spaces. Um, next is the ecological potential. Um, um, the forest gardens, if we're looking at them, naturally they're very diverse in their plant, uh, both genetically, functionally, structurally, you know, so you've got a lot of diversity going on there. And that diversity translates higher up the food chain, so you've got a lot of invertebrate diversity, so which then makes great habitat for predators and for birds and for small mammals. So there's a lot uh, to be gained. And um, I mean, this uh, is a photo of a forest garden in Manchester, Birchfields Forest Garden, in a public park, and that's been studied by ecologists and um, on behalf of the uh, can uh, council, Manchester Council, and it's been identified as a biodiversity <coughs> hotspot. So it means that like, the biodiversity there is significantly higher than in the surrounding parkland and significantly higher than in the surrounding area and in Manchester in general. So uh, forest gardens really can uh, be an excellent resource on that level. There are other ecological benefits that uh, people often quote, like soil building, carbon capture, climate regulation. Um, there is very little, uh, at the moment, there's very little factual uh, evidence beyond the anecdotal about that. So that's a real research task to think about, kind of how do we show that. And some of the uh, work that the association is doing with participative methods of soil um, research may help us with that. So that's ecological potential. Next if you may, thank you. Uh, commercial potential, uh, at the moment, there aren't uh, that many commercial forest gardens out there, but uh, those that I have found now, there are some really interesting, innovative and sophisticated solutions emerging. Um, so and one, one thing that I think I've found is that forest gardens generally seem to support or fit in with other modes of, or other forms of productions on site. Um, very often, so that can be market gardening of annual vegetables, of other crops, uh, or that can be uh, often education as well as a form of production. Um, picture here is uh, of Primrose Farm in the Welsh borders. Um, so excellent, excellent <coughs> example, small site, but again, kind of a massive diversity of crops going in there. And the forest garden takes up about a third of the site and it supplies uh, a lot of products itself, uh, leaf crops, especially in the, what's called the hungry gap period in spring, where there's not much annual veg growing. Uh, and then there's obviously the peak of fruit, like in the late summer and autumn. Um, so they contribute quite a lot. Uh, and there's herbs throughout the year as well. Um, and on top of that, it's... Uh, provides a lot of organic matter. It provides uh, materials like canes and stakes. Um, it also acts as a windbreak, as a climate regulator, and as a biodiversity reservoir, so it contributes to the pest, uh, pest control function of the site. So um, forest gardens also make great settings for learning activities, for social activities, and a lot of sites kind of like integrate them for those reasons. Um, so, in terms of maximizing the commercial potential, the fifth skill set, kind of that, uh, you want, uh, if you're going down that route, is obviously marketing. So you need to think about uh, how do you actually make that uh, make that viable. And uh, it's been interesting to see how people explore niches, kind of, so niche markets uh, for forest garden products, but also trying to add value, kind of in terms of medicinal or cosmetic or other products. Uh, to uh, through processing uh, some of the uh, crops on site. Um, the other aspect is to think about what are the complementary forms of production that the forest garden fits in with, and how, what does that mean for the layout, and how do you, how do, how do we space plants and so on. Right. So that's a lot of potential, uh, but um, it's also worth looking at and uh, considering some of the challenges that we're facing, as I say, forest gardens have been going for less than a human generation, and they 
uh, have a have a human lifespan. So we really start we're really still starting to learn about these spaces. Um, so there are new ways of growing at high density. And so one question is, what does that mean in terms of plant health or system health? You know, so that uh, and, and temperate climates kind of that hasn't really been uh, practiced much. So are there opportunities for pests and diseases in those systems? And if we're thinking about plant selection, um, in our baseline survey, we found that uh, like there's a few families that seem to feature quite prominently. I mean, the, the rose family, obviously in a top fruit layer and in a soft fruit layer, has a lot of rose bushes and there's strawberries on the ground as well. And so are there, as you, so are there, is there a transferability of diseases between those plant, plants in that family? That's one question. And on the ground layer, I mean, the mint family is also quite prominent, so that might be another one that potentially might be vulnerable. So plant choice there is a, is a key thing. Um, and then another uh, thing we are discussed with Beth and Stagger, researcher in, um, that's orange, good, I have five minutes. A researcher at uh, Schumacher College was about <laughs> the possibility that we're developing what, what you might call disease ladders or pest ladders, you know, so that actually uh, pests and diseases climb through the, under, uh, through the ground layer and herb layer uh, into the top food layer and like that do damage there. So there's obvious questions for design, maintenance, uh, and layout of the forest garden. The second, quest, uh, second uh, area of challenge, um, Tori, Toby Hammondway uh, introduced the word legibility into permaculture discussion, uh, which is the question, do I understand what's going on here? Like what's mm -hmm. growing here? Can I eat it? What can I eat? How do I use it? And especially if you're new to forest gardening, it can be quite bewildering wandering in there and kind of, yeah, you can starve in an edible system. You know, <laughs> you know. so, um, so the challenge there is then to develop layouts for uh, forest gardens that help uh, non-experts navigate the space while still retaining the benefits of diversity that make forest gardens great spaces. Um, especially community and public spaces, I mean, that's a really important task. Um, and a, a related thing is about uh, the aesthetic, so the question like how acceptable that, uh, the wild aesthetic that forest gardens often have are in the public eye. Um, so that's partly an educational task, but also it's important to think about aesthetics when we're working in public spaces and community spaces. Finally, succession. Um, so that's a threefold, threefold challenge, I think. So one is that we're, like in, in forest gardens, like especially again where pe people work together, uh, there seem to be like a certain waves of care and neglect, you know, depending on like what people are doing with their lives, who comes in and out. Um, the forest gardens are more resilient than annual systems to kind of just leaving, being left for a year or two. But after that, there are tipping points where the functionality declines, species disappear, so we're, like, we're losing uh, some of the systems. So uh, looking at those patterns and kind of bringing them back, reining them back in at the right time is important. Um, another question is what happens when key people leave? So how is knowledge and how are skills passed on and kind of how is that handover process um, managed and so it's really important in a way to think about the people with the key skill sets as key elements of our system and making sure that those skills are transferred before they disappear um, finally uh, the, another question is like about um, how do forest gardens survive changes in ownership and changes in priorities of the owners? You know, uh, there are quite a few examples that I've come across where forest gardens have disappeared or have been like basically uh, degraded to a point where they're no, no longer functional. In the most sad and like most prominent uh, example probably is Robert Hart's garden itself, which that is no longer accessible and uh, like much degraded. So thinking about kind of yeah, how do we hand on? The knowledge and the ability to manage them and also the interest in managing them is another aspect. And that's, that's probably almost a cultural task about basically if everybody knows about Forest Garden is interested, then they are safe spaces you know, and those spaces will last. Great, so um, 
I also felt like, in terms of surprises, kind of in that research, I mean, one thing that really surprised me about uh, that seven-layer model that Robert Hart, Robert Hart proclaimed uh, doesn't really exist in practice. You know, so what you get is, I mean, you get all the seven layers, but you, nev you don't generally get them in the same space. You know, so you get different patches, and typical numbers are between three and five layers in any one patch. Um, so that'd be an interesting research. That's why it's certainly my hypothesis would be that it's something to do with the light limits of the space, mm. like of temperate zones, you know, so that actually there isn't enough light to feed seven layers of plants. Okay, so it's over, is it? No. <laughs> um, okay, so... <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, okay, so just to summarize in one minute, um, very few fo uh, forest gardens are great spaces to learn about like the key skills that are needed to <coughs> interact with nature uh, in a productive way and feed ourselves. Very few forest gardeners start with those key skills, so success really depends on the ability to develop and maintain those necessary skills, on continuity of management, and on security of tenure. You know, so if those are given, then we've got a good chance of creating long-lasting ecosystems that feed and house and clothe us. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Thomas, for giving us a, a very broad overview as well as going deep and some potential questions. Um, yes. And now we have some potential questions in a moment. We're going to do a daring thing, take one minute to just stand up um, imagine the best forest garden you've ever seen or dreamed of and just become that forest garden in a succession with your arms stretching. This is just a body movement thing, really. Stretching, the understory species protecting, <laughs> stretching up to the sky, being the climax species. And just like that weeping willow, just drop yourself right down. Oh. Um, <laughs> pick up a few fruit. <laughs> Put it on your belly, rub your belly. Oh, oh. great. Oh, you sad. Thank you, Tex. Questions is going to be name, country, question, victim. Questions? Uh, on that? Um. Name and um, John Porter, UK. Yes, no. <laughs> okay. I, I, I knew Robert Hart, and I, right in the early days of Forest Gardens, I set up one myself. And I just want to make two, two points which I didn't know about at the time, it's much more known now. I was, you know, I was very ignorant. Planted trees too close. I mean, this is a light issue yep, yep, in temperate yep, okay. conditions. Plant, trees too close. And secondly, I do grow vegetables in a sort of a, open space amongst uh -huh. my trees yeah. and the issue in a lot of our summers these days is moisture being taken up by the trees uh -huh. from the vegetable growing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so, yeah. so it's yeah, um, interesting I, mean, and I think in terms of patterns there's definitely a pattern there that a lot of people are very optimistic with their tree spacing mm -hmm. and so yeah you need to really think about the like the final uh, like spread of those trees yeah. and out of those trees uh, there are some really interesting patterns of vegetable growing in forest, uh, like in a forest garden system. There's a brilliant one in Austria where uh, by <coughs> Margarita Langerhoff, who Betty, Betty Day, her and her partner, who's unfortunately dead now, Betty Day, I created this sort of grid pattern. So it's, I think they're lucky enough to have a south facing hill, but you don't need that necessarily. And so you've got this spine of trees yes. with shrubs around them, um, like uh, some ground cover on there, and then, then you've got like a 10 meter square of vegetable production yeah. within that. So you've got the shelter, but you haven't yeah. got like the, all the root competition from the trees. Yeah. And yeah. that seems to work extremely yeah. well, the healthiest vegetable I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. Sorry, who is that? Um, if you speak German, get their books. Jacobus and Margareta Langerhorst. And we'll leave this paper out so that if you want to get the actual spellings yeah. clearly can yeah. see from far throughout the end. Okay. Um, Martin, Japan. Uh -huh. um, 
I've been recently involved with uh, setting up a food forest. Um, just briefly to the global bit, and when I go back to Japan, I'll probably be getting more involved with it. Your research, where can I get forward with more information? Is it possible? Sorry, can you speak louder, please? I've been involved with a food forest setting up. Yeah, yeah, I've got that. So the question. I'm just curious, where can I get forward with more Where? Uh, the, research. the research, um, if you're looking at permaculture.org.uk slash research, um, you'll find projects, and one of them is forest garden research, and there's the baseline report, and uh, there's also like a, our field trials that we've done with the association. If you want to get hold of the case studies, yes. uh, uh, look out next year for the book, Real Life Forest Gardens. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. um, just Margaret Lingwood, UK. It's just thought I'd say there's one old English model that we never seem to mention, and that is the hedgerow. Mm -hmm. yes. um, because yes. they traditionally they were very diverse sources of wild mm -hmm. food for country people. Yeah. And particularly if you don't have a lot of space for your forest garden, if you try planting your spine of trees in a north-south direction, yes. you're going to get light uh, for half a day on each side of yes. it. That's and right. this is a, a local English-British yeah. model that we could think about. Yeah. More. yeah, very good point. I mean, if you're talking about indigenous knowledge and indigenous techniques, you know, we're not just talking about like uh, rainforest tribes. We're talking about indigenous knowledge of wherever you live. You know, so what have people done? And hedgerow pattern, you know, if you're thinking about this, this is almost a hedgerow pattern, you know, and so agroforestry, you know, so that's compatible with that as well. So yeah, absolutely. So, start. Hi, Star Hawk, I'm from Northern California. It's great to see you again, Thomas. Mm, um, I wanted to recommend a resource, which is Mark Shepard's book, Restoration to Agriculture, where he's looking at savanna systems and forest gardens that do integrate animals, um, but really actually looking at the yields they can potentially produce. And yeah. he's got a really incredible model in Wisconsin. And um, an excellent film as well. Actually, yeah. Like an hour I think you're going to show film. the film here and have it that Great. shows his place. Yeah. Thank you. And just say we have forest gardens that are Mediterranean based, mm -hmm. where we have other constraints. One yes. which is getting enough water uh -huh. that you can establish. Yeah. Yeah. But you have relieved my residual sense of guilt from <laughs> never quite getting all seven layers. In the ah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pleased if that's all that comes out of this workshop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So been. Uh, in terms of like the geographical spread of the research I've done, it's mainly been cool temperate uh, climate because basically that's the ones I've had access to easily. There are a few Mediterranean ones, but I'd, I'd be, I will carry this research on and I'd love to talk to you. I'd love to talk to anybody uh, who's got a forest garden working with them. Grab me and yeah, I can't get enough of it. So. <laughs> So let's have uh, two more shorter questions, or one, because you started okay, late, yeah. um, or one kind of deeper question. Looks like we've got one and a two. Yeah. Yeah. So first of all, <laughs> yeah. so I'm again, it's Elena down. from Spain, and then I just noticed that uh, you have all these interesting key skills in uh, all the different categories you mentioned, but not in ecological poten potential. Uh, there was no key skill related to that that you mentioned. I would like to know if, uh, if there is something. Ecology is definitely one of the three core skills. So it's ecology, so understanding your local ecology. Okay. Uh, there is horticulture, so like getting a good grasp on how to work with plants. And the third one is design, so really getting to grips with layout, with functionality, with how space uh, evolves over time. Yes, but that was more related with real potential. With ecological potential, is uh -huh. there something else that, than, uh, or is uh -huh. it just about to create ecological potential? I see, I see. Yeah. Um, well, I think those three skills are um, yes. key for the ecological potential as well as the yeah. potential. They're, they're for, for all of them. You know, so then if you're working in a social situation, then that's the people's skills. Mm -hmm. If you're working in a commercial situation, that's the marketing. And, Project management is probably another one, which is kind of basically the reality of kind of 
keeping things going, you know, so that's another whole set there. I'll add that. Um, so, and final question. question. Yeah. Um, again, Mark Schiefman from the Netherlands. Um, I have a question. You, you talked about pest management. Yeah. Pests that are troublesome. Um, but in a food forest system, uh, you should have mycorrhizal fungi, which should help the plants to be very, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, how do you yeah. say? Robust. Robust. Resilient. Yeah, that's good. Word. Resilient. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you research that too? Um, someone should do some research. Uh, um, um, I'd say, uh, yes, we're basically like having a good soil structure and a good soil life really helps. Uh, it's not the whole answer. Uh, and as you, I think it relates to the fact that kind of, uh, like there is no such thing as a no maintenance garden. You know, whatever system of garden you're doing, a garden, I mean, like that's, that's probably the best fertilizes the garden's footstep, you know, and it goes for forest gardens. The more interacting interaction you have with it, the better. And basically you the garden will tell you where you need to tweak it and when you, where you need to change it. I think airflow and um, uh, light are really important in temperate climates because it's damper um, and basically like fungal diseases really like they, they like uh, damp uh, dark conditions. So Actually, having airflow, especially below the canopy, is actually it's it's a design challenge, you know. So, but it's doable. People, people do. Thank Thanks you. so much, Thomas. Give <laughs>
So this is about ancient food, future food, foraging in the forest garden and seeing everywhere as a forest garden. Okay, and it's about being indigenous. Um, so for a long time, I struggled with the idea that we're destroying the earth as human beings. I was lucky in my early 20s to discover permaculture. And since then, I felt hopeful and very passionate about permaculture. I absolutely love it. So I'm really pleased that this is happening here today. It's very exciting. Um, but what I realized a few years ago is that we can't not be connected to nature. We can't because we are part of nature. Um, but what's really interesting about the way that my life's unfolded is that, yeah, I trained as a landscape architect and I was lucky to do permaculture design as part of my training um, in 92. And so I designed, I've designed a lot of places and they've come and gone. But what's really interesting, I started foraging about 20 years ago quite seriously because I wanted to eat organic food and it was hard to get to buy it then. Um, but now I've been taking people foraging for about six, seven years. And I've just discovered there's food everywhere, everywhere I go, every day of the year. And if you look outside the window, <laughs> uh, you'll see some food. Mm -hmm. So I worked, we worked out the tree is the tree of heaven, it's an alianthus. And I looked, I checked on the Plants for a Future website this morning. <laughs> and you can eat the leaves of this tree, they need cooking. Uh, it's also got lots of medicinal qualities. But I'm finding this with every plant, every plant, every animal as well. Has a, 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 is, is useful. Um, so uh, that's what I'm hoping to get across in this talk. Uh, right, second. Down. Down. Okay. So, uh, so we are part of the wildlife when we are like this, which I find really exciting. Um, there's so many aha moments that I keep finding about making gardens like this and using them. And one of the strap lines I have is that um, we can find food every day of the year. So one of the things that I've discovered is that I like to... Oh, I'm just going to go back to that first slide. This is a salad, a typical summer salad, one that might look like one we had this week earlier, um, is that um, there's about this time of year there's maybe 80 different things in there. Uh, in the winter, there's a four, maybe 40. There's not so many things around, but there's still a lot. Uh, it's just slower to collect things. So there's... A, there's for us, you know, in the winter we can make soups from the things we find, from the leaves. Lots of flowers around at the moment, and that's not even counting the fruit that's around, which is so abundant here. Um, so we are part of the wildlife, and um, one of the things about the natural systems is that um, I believe, this is a recent aha, is that the talk this morning by, is it Ken, the uh, earth scientist? Um, we haven't just co-evolved with the plants. They were around a long time before we were. Maybe 40, oh, I don't know, how, how many long? If, if, the year, if it was a year in time since life started, plants have been around approximately a month. We've been around about 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. So we have fitted into the ecosystem around the plants, and there have some plants that have evolved with us over the last 40,000 years or so. But there's no coincidence um, that plants are medicinal as well as food and all the other things. It's because it's, it, that's how we've survived. It's so obvious, really. But I think, you know, unless we think about things in this way, it might not be obvious. So one of the lovely things about being an indigenous person is that we access a wild cycle of food, which is just so beautiful. And, yeah, if we can get our veg box where someone grows food for us, we get that cycle as well. But the cycle exists in a way which supports our body wherever we are in the world. And here in the UK, we have, um, in the spring, lots of detoxing herbs that help us get going again after the sluggish winter. In the summer and the early autumn, we have lots of foods that build our systems and boost our immune systems for the long, dark winters. And in the winters, we get lots of roots which are full of carbs, carb, carb rich carbohydrates. And unless we've got really thick covering of snow, which we don't get that often, um, there are always leaves around as well, lots of leaves. And then, uh, I'm not even going to mention the animals, um, uh, and then in the spring again we get the, 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 the leaves. So that's a really lovely wild cycle. There's someone called Fiona Campbell, who um, I'm very inspired by. She explored being a hunter-gatherer in, our, in, our, you know, in the UK, and she's written a book about this. And she's travelled around meeting lots of indigenous people, seeing how they do things. And she, she um, 
she practices this here. I haven't met her personally, but I think she's awesome. Um, so she's really inspired me, and she talks about this. I accidentally discovered this, and um, but she talks about it a lot more. She, she's coined a term like sort of how we fit, um, we just fit into the ecosystem so well. So this is a food forest I was involved with that was planted in 1996. And like Thomas was saying, uh, people have come and gone. This is a public community place. It doesn't exist anymore as a food forest, but what's interesting is it's evolved and the canopy is still there and they're, they're growing lots of raised beds of vegetables next to it and some of the herbs are there, but all the other layers have gone. I wanted to just explain what a forest garden is because I don't think we've actually covered that yet. We've talked a lot about forest gardens, but um, Robert Hart coined the term in the 70s uh, after travelling to Kerala in India and discovered that there's home gardens and these are systems all over the world where people uh, get their medicines and food from. And he decided to make one in Shropshire. And it sort of started a whole movement in this country. So, um, all right, so the F's of forest, gar forest gardening. <laughs> all right, I'm going to write F on here because... Uh, I don't know, it's a bit weird how F fits in so well. But, uh, so some of these are mine, but they're mostly, oh, oh, there's a slide missing, never mind. Um, gonna have to use my memory. So there's, a, there's so David Jack, one of the uh, co-authors of the Forest Garden Bibles, he, he talked about seven Fs, and um, there's fuel, fodder, food, pharmacy, it's a bit of a cheat, <laughs> <laughs> fun, Forage. fodder, uh, furniture, I don't know if you can think of any First aid, uh, did I say fun? Fun. <laughs> okay, so we can meet a lot of yields from the forest garden um, systems, not just food. And in fact, one of the things that I've discovered is that food is our medicine, and medicine is our food, as Hippocrates said um, thousand, a couple of thousand years ago, right? Uh, <laughs> And I, I believe this to be true, because I've foraged for so long in my life, I feel really well almost all the time. I rarely get ill. I only get run down because I try and do too much, because there's so many great things to do. Um, right. So there's four there's Fs with foraging as well. So the four Fs for foraging, when I take people foraging, there's sort of rules to follow. And if we follow those rules, we can't go wrong, actually. Um, so I, I, have to, I, I have to tell you, I have to start from scratch. Both my parents grew up um, in self-sufficient places. Uh, my father grew up in the mountains in Italy, and I was, I was lucky to see this sort of peasant farming way of existing. Uh, you know, it's like a whole permaculture system. Uh, everyone grew their own crops, they had fruit trees, animals, um, they, they, they cut down the wood for the forest for their logs. You know, it was amazing to see that, and I think that's why I just clicked with permaculture straight away. Uh, but for two years, in the Second World War, they had to, his family had to hide in the mountains from the Germans, and they basically foraged. They had sweet chestnut trees and acorns, and I think that was the main way they uh, survived, and they hunted, and they had fresh water from the springs. But, you know, there's something about that which really gets me, because, you know, they're seen as a family food now, the sweet chestnuts there. Uh, but, you know, we might need that knowledge. So I, t I think it's important to know that I've started from scratch. Um, and I just see food everywhere I go, and that's what I hope to, to um, share with people. So this is a typical salad in the spring, and you can see lots of weird stuff that you might not know you could eat, like aquilegia flowers. They're just one of the most bonkers flowers we have. And you can eat the leaves uh, and the dandelions. So this is a salad maybe with 50 or so things in it about May, um, but they're so delicious. Um, and we usually make a dressing, and it's, it's not like there's, there's a lot of bitter things, but actually when we eat salads like this, we can add a few ordinary lettuce leaves if we want to tone it down a bit. But there's just something wonderful about eating like this. And it makes nice, nice pictures on Facebook. <laughs> um, so the, it's really important to know, to, so for me, um, we are past the wildlife, and it was by accident when someone asked me to design a wildlife garden they could eat that uh, I'd realised that I was already designing and making wildlife gardens. I hadn't made that connection fully. I was interested in wildlife. I like bees and birds and things. 
but my focus was on permaculture and designing food systems and so my gardens win awards they don't just win awards but they get gold first time which is just really surprising but awesome and it confirms that you know we are part of the wildlife because these gardens are for us as well so oh i forgot to mention oh miss i put little permaculture principles on the top of these they've been edited out for some reason anyway uh, the garden so these gardens uh, i've got uh, three gardens i've made that i'm looking after for people at the moment and um, the yields are theoretically unlimited we keep finding more and more ways to eat things. Um, so you can see chives, there's lots of different types of onions and brassicas we eat and herbs. And so all the layers are there. It's, it's just, because I've been doing it for so long and I've seen it work and I eat from them every day, it's very, very exciting. I mean, I've never used animals in the system apart from the wildlife. So I know that's a whole other area because naturally animals are part of that. Um, so, uh, so in terms of, the garden, I wanted to mention about um, how the body of the soil and building soil is an important part of it. Uh, I, don't, I never use chemicals other than natural ones. And I noticed that the way we use um, compost teas, for example, like comfrey and nettle, um, all the herbs that we use in the garden have a similar effect on our bodies as the land. And I think that's more than a coincidence. I don't know if anyone's heard of any research about that. But for example, nettle. Nettle's meant to be a really good nitrogen builder for the soil. It helps bring the garden into balance. Uh, and it does the same thing for our body. I've studied biodynamic agriculture as well and worked on vegetable growing stuff over the years. And uh, the biodynamic herbal preparations uh, work on the soil as teas in a similar way, uh, like the chamomile and the dandelion and the um, oak bark. They bring the living elements to the compost. Um, right, plants. So this is really exciting because the plants, plants are our friends and they're, 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 they all do amazing things for us. I just wanted to mention, uh, actually this is a good time, Ravina, for that uh, bag. Okay, I'm giving you a bit extra. We're going to finish it three parts because of the yep. pickup, so I've got it. I'm not sure. Do you, oh, the good time to leave. Yes, yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, so, so So with plants, this, um, like Chris was saying earlier, the Plants for Future website's got 7,000 plants on there for us to learn about. And I use it a lot as a designer. I use it all the time. And when I take people foraging, I say, if you know the name of a plant, you can look it up on Plants for the Future and you can find out if you can eat it or use it in any way. There's not many plants that aren't there, <laughs> I tell you. Uh, I, I, like I said, I looked that one up earlier. Um, so there are about 20,000 edible plants in the world, okay? 5,000 we can eat in our climate. 90% of the time, the whole world eats about 20 species of plants, which is just not, you know, not me, maybe not you, but that's how it is. There's just so much we're not getting from our food that's grown um, in a conventional way. This, when we eat like this, we're accessing micronutrients that aren't available to modern contemporary agriculture. In fact, the way I trained as a landscape architect, I think it had it in my mind that all the soil was doing was holding up plants. Over the years, I've discovered actually soil's amazing. It's really alive, and there's studies that have shown that in a teaspoon of soil, there's one to two billion bits of life in there, of <laughs> fungi and nematodes and bacteria. Uh, it's absolutely amazing. It's the most abundant ecosystem we have. These all help make different nutrients and minerals accessible to the plants, which we can then eat as food. What I'm just passing around is some rosemary. If you can just rub it and just smell it, this is a, it stimulates our mental abilities, apparently. Um, I was going to do a little exercise, but I'm, I'm not, because I know it'll take too long. But what I'd like you to uh, just to be aware of is that Every, every single plant does something for us. I'm, well, it's my theory, but I'm sure it's the case. And I think because we evolved alongside the plants, wherever we are in the world, these plants will do things, important jobs for us. I wanted to mention Hawthorne, one of our natives. Yeah, I've experiment, experimented a lot with different exotics over the years. I turned my back totally on natives for a long time. 
But now I'm just blown away by how amazing our native plants are. And they grow really easily because they're meant to be here. And the hedgerow, like, um, like you were saying, sorry, I can't remember your name. Um, it's, the hedgerow is our remnant woodlands. We don't have much um, indigenous forests anymore. We've got very little left. But the hedgerows are still here. And the hawthorn is the most common shrub in our hedgerows. So this is just an awesome medicinal plant. And there's a brilliant book called Hedgerow Medicine by some seal and seal. And they suggest that the leaves, flowers and berries are a heart tonic that protects and strengthens. It's a pro it has a prophylactic, it is a prophylactic, which means it prevents disease. It can dilate the coronary arteries and strengthen the heart muscles without raising blood pressure. It can lower blood cholesterol. It is meant to do all this in a gentle way. Why don't we all know this? Why aren't we all eating hawthorn all the time? I can tell you why. It's the same reason why we're not eating foraging in the wild and why we're eating lots of chemically grown vegetables. I think it's because maybe we ha don't have time to think about these things, but as long as money is the main reason that things get done and not health, then maybe we'll never do that. Well, that's my own personal opinion. But I think if health becomes the most important reason for eating things and growing things, then we will, this, this is a great way of doing it. So just a quick thing about how, just do it. Just start, one plant at a time. This is some fennel in a bit of water. Great for digestion after a meal. There's just so many different ways we can do it. Cultivate an attitude of curiosity and wonder. Why wouldn't we listen to our bodies? The activity I wanted to do with you, because I've also trained as a kinesiologist, which probably sounds really you random. You demonstrate it. You can <laughs> with me if you like. Thank you. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. So I just want to know that we have an innate <coughs> wisdom. And if, you, if you're a bit sensitive, you'll understand what I mean. We can, um, if you smell this, you might even think, oh, you know, it's not just nearly lunchtime. You know, I can keep going for a lot longer. Um, but we can... We can be intuitive about what's good for us and what's not. And I encourage people to do this when I take them foraging. We can get a lot of information just if we trust ourselves. Um, because we have to start somewhere. So there's, there is a way of starting from first principles with foraging as well. Um, so, just, I know I'm going to run out of time. I always do this, but the future... Breathing, and oh. <laughs> we've got, you know, depends how much questions. You might want to eat into the question time a wee bit. Carry on. Yeah, no, I'm going to... There's only two. There's only, this is, we're at the end now, but... The, um, this is a project I'm working on in Margate, urban. It's an urban edible project. We've planted food all along the high street. Um, it's flowers. So it's disguised as a, a flower planting. But so this is... This is uh, part of a, a movement. Incredible Edible Todmorden is leading the way brilliantly. But why, why grow? We don't just need to grow vegetables, we can grow perennials. There's already loads of food we can eat in the cities. Lime trees are one of the best examples because you can eat the leaves all through the year. There's loads of food anyway. We just need to learn how to utilise it. <coughs> the future is nuts. I think, <laughs> yeah, right. So, nut trees, we can use eat those instead of wheat and their perennial crops. There's all, this research being done by Martin Crawford and the Agro um, Forestry Research um, Trust about this. Um, but they are yummy, and this is the hazelnuts are something that are grown really well in our country and uh, native in the hedgerows. I've got funding to plant a community nut orchard. I really believe in this idea and want to mention seaweeds and fungi as well. Three easy ways to um, meet lots of our dietary needs without taking up lots of lands and resources. I don't know what that's doing there. <laughs> oh no, my slide has gone a bit wrong. I'm going to go back to the first slide, or not. <laughs> While you're doing that, um, I'd like to ask everybody to rub it between the hands again, take a smell, and let's just get a few responses. What comes up on you as a response? What comes up on your body? What comes up in your feelings? A gift back to you. Okay, call it out. Strength. Yes? Strength. Strength. <laughs> Grandmother. Grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> Those old triggers of smell. Oh. Uh huh. Funding. Yeah. Three more. Regeneration. Regeneration. Peace. Peace. Thank you. It gives you, you time to that. thank you. And we're going to have questions, you know, the story, stand, name, country, and question, and keep them succinct for questions so we get the richness of response. Thank you. Any questions? Oh, they're all involved with the rosemary, so forget about questions. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm Anna from 
Can you speak, please? Sorry. <coughs> Anna from the UK. Um, yeah, I was just wondering where you got foraging. Where do I do foraging? Yeah, whereabouts? Uh, in Kent's. In Kent. At, at right. most permaculture convergences, if anyone's going. Where else? <laughs> yeah. uh, I live in Canterbury. Okay. Yeah. But I do it all around East Kent mostly. Okay. Just when people ask me. I'm happy to come to you. I might ask you. <laughs> Thank you. It seems like an open invitation. <laughs> Hi from Market Japan. Uh, foraging in cities, how safe is it with car pollution? I'm glad you asked that. Um, there, it's one of the rules is to be careful where you forage because of pollution. And that's the only cases I've known anyone's been ill apart from having a heart condition. Um, so um, it's about common sense. But an important point is that plants growing in the environments where we live are giving us something interesting. So I would encourage you to pl eat, eat, not just, just, just to um, eat plants where there's not direct pollution, but there'll be extra benefits for, you, for people living in that environment, for plants growing there. Yeah. Just for example, you said the tree over here Well, this is possibly one of the busiest roads yeah. in the world. So. <laughs> I, I, think I would be, I would use my intuition, my mind, my intellectual mind says don't do that. But I would, you, you would know, I think, if you listen to yourself. But I would, the rule of thumb is about 15 meters to 50 meters away. Don't forget to stay in May in the country. Mars, Australia. I just wanted to add to it. Um, a very important tool to remember as well is roots are always the first plants to pick up the um, poisons. Then come the fruit, um, no, then come the leaves, then come the um, fruit. So anything also like another higher away from the ground it is the less of a um, chance of pollution that is in it as well. And if you do like foraging in forests and parks and stuff, also like you know, keep your eyes open for signs that things have been spread. And if there's been something spread, give it back, you know, like a few weeks, so the plants can, like, you know, like, absorb it, and then, like, a bit of it, and regenerate from it. But, um, yeah, these are the really important parts to do. And, like, you know, if you know a good area, kind of, like, you know, keep it secret. <laughs> because, like, you know, everybody else will also go there and, like, you know, like, harvest them instead of you. Um, but, yeah, like, these are just the very common things. I have to say that um, I don't, I, I would say different things to that. Um, I'm not going to disagree with what you said. But I think there's a lot of contradiction with different things and different people, and I think that's fine. So you need to pick what you want to do. Um, okay. uh, but in the UK, you said about the four areas for foraging, can yeah. you go back to that? Um, it's, it's the flowers, um, the foliage, the fungi, and the fruit. That relates to when we forage in public places where we're allowed to go. We should get the landowner's permission, in this country anyway, uh, but we're not allowed to dig roots up. That's the sort of main thing, um, without permission. And there might be protected species. But nothing I forage is protected, I checked. Yeah. John Porter, UK again, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, um, my, my problem with foraging is, is that the mammals that forage my hazelnuts. <laughs> and this year, some bird has destroyed the whole of my hazelnut crop. So I, I, I know with growing hazelnuts that you can, some people eat the squirrels that try and get there first. <laughs> and that is an issue. And as someone who doesn't like killing animals, I don't know what I'm going to do about that with my food forest, but I, that's the solution that we need to find. Yeah. Um, we get, we've got time for one or two more. Yeah, you can choose. And then we can pop time back. <laughs> 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 so in, in my experience, Thank you very much. Sorry, thank you very much. Just turn, making it into a question more, do you find also that whatever the insect can eat 
then you can eat. Is that your experience? I've been, uh, I've been asked this. That is one line really important that so many people are thinking about how I can grow up something in my garden. You need to learn about your organ. And this one is number one important that they, there is a food to support your liver, there is a food to support your kidney and the missing. And when you come in your home, that it's really important to have all the food to survive your life. A little summary, there's a food to support every part of our body out in the wilderness to forage from. We're, well, we're winding up, yeah. um, not quite yet. Can Any I response to that, please? Okay. Um, I think seaweed's the one thing in this country that other foragers might not eat because our, our waters are very polluted <coughs> and it can absorb heavy metals. I've, my response to this is that our, when we're strong, our bodies re are really good at working with the food and getting what we need from it. If, if we're not strong and not used to it, like an older person or a young person, we might need, we might need to stay away from those sort of things. But again, it's about, about becoming part of the ecosystem and in, indigenous again, where we have the confidence to trust ourselves, to eat these things. And I think when we compare it to what we can get but buying it, why wouldn't we want to forage and make our own gardens that we can eat in? I'm going to end with my vision, which is a permaculture vision, where we create our own food where we live, locally, because that's the key word, is that it's local, a local resource, uh, uh, grown where we are, and that, that's where we need to concentrate growing food, and forest gardens are brilliant, but I imagine that one day, and it might be hundreds of years in the future, that everywhere else will be given back to the wilderness, mm -hmm. that we can go and forage in, but we let, we let the sort of natural systems return. That's, that's sort of the big vision, which isn't mine, it's a permaculture idea, but yeah. I love that idea, and this is, for me, is part of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, I just want to, we said the word, return again, <laughs> return again, return, again. return to again. the land of your soul. Thank you so much. <laughs>